All right, here I am doing my first video of 2022 in July. Hard to believe. This video is going to be on the T5 non-world-class five-speed transmission. But before I get into that, a few things. Uh, first off, the reason why I haven't been around is because both my mom passed away and Rhonda's mom passed away in the beginning of the year. And for those two years prior, we were dealing with a lot of hospital situations, hospice situations, and her mom being in New York and my mom in Florida, she wasn't even here that much for most of the year. So uh, on top of that, my sister died from COVID. And so there was a lot of stuff going on and I just couldn't really focus too much on the business. Family came first, you know, and uh, that's that. So we're all back together again. Everything is good and we're getting on track with everything. We took some time off to kind of regroup and get everything going here. And that's it. So this first transmission that I'm doing this year, people have been asking me about a T5 non-world-class five-speed transmission. And this one I grabbed from the money I got from the Buy Me A Coffee funds. And the Buy Me A Coffee, a lot of people, they call me up and say, oh, I'd love to buy you a cup of coffee. Can I get you something? And so this link here that I'm going to show you on Buy Me Coffee, what it does is it allows me to get the funds to buy the cores because I might not get these jobs in-house much. So please, if you want to contribute to Buy Me A Coffee or you find this video helpful in any way, that would be awesome. I want to shout out to a bunch of people who really helped me with Buy Me A Coffee, especially some people that were very generous to send me checks, which I really wasn't uh, expecting. But thank you guys very much. It was much, most appreciated. My book, Building and Modifying High Performance Manual Transmissions, is available on Amazon and on my website. I don't know how long this book is going to be available anymore, so you may want to pick it up. It's got a lot of good building on all these different transmissions from the top loader, to the T5, the Muncie 4 Speed, the T10, the Super T10, Chrysler A833. It's a really good book, learning theory and clutches and shifters are mentioned in that book as well. And so, again, all the information is in the link below. And please subscribe to my channel and leave comments. Give me a thumbs up and all that good stuff. Let's get to it. Thing is really messy. Somebody drilled a hole in the top cover over here. Doesn't look good. <laughs> so a few things. Cover bolts are 10 millimeter. Front bearing retainer bolts are 13 millimeter. Extension housing bolts, 15 millimeter. You never have to remove this Torx bit. It's tamper proof. Reverse light switch is broken. Pretty messed up. It looks like it was cut out of a car. The cable for the speedometer is here. It looks like it was cut off. So first thing we're gonna do is remove the dowel pin just by pushing it in. That's all you do. It's a 530 second pin. That's gonna allow us to take the whole extension housing off this way, and this will slide off the rail. You don't have to take it off. It'll naturally come off the rail when we take the extension housing off. What I wanna show you is that these transmissions look identical from world-class to non-world-class. Splines are the same, output shaft splines are the same. The only difference is, is the front bearing cup, which is really hard to see on this because it's completely rusted and filthy but I'll show you a comparison later on when we get more into that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the extension housing off, slide that off, then take the top cover off. All right, so one thing that I do with these transmissions, if you don't have an impact gun, I actually don't recommend using an impact gun on these because you can easily strip the bolts out. So I use a simple box wrench, and what I'll do is I'll put a hammer on the end of it just like this and shock them loose. You know, go through all the bolts like that, uh, rather than using a gun and risk you know, stripping the bolt head out. So I'll go through all these like that. And then I can actually, they can actually finish taking them off with my electric gun. 
What's interesting about this is it's still got the tag on it. The tag will tell you the actual model number of the transmission. You could still get most of the parts for this, and I'll show you how you can even uh, use non-world class and mix them, mix world class and non-world class parts together. So they come off very easy with the electric gun once you just shock the bolts loose. Usually, if I'm building a lot of these, I just use new hardware, okay? But if you're going to use the hardware, you have to clean it up. A lot of times, to me, it's not worth wasting the time cleaning up hardware when I can just get new hardware. The new hardware usually comes with sealant built into it, but you can buy any types of uh, grade 8 bolts, or these are 10.9 bolts of the metric. Lightly bang it like this back and forth, and you'll usually will break the silicone seal loose on this, okay? And it'll come right off. If you see it, it's going to come right off right now. And what I'm going to do is just push this thing with my fingers, put them in here like this. And that disengages it from the rail, and the whole piece will slide out. Now, the non-world class T5 5-speed uses a thrust bearing in the back instead of tapered bearings. So it's a thrust bearing and a race, and this is a little oil, it's a little oil or funnel cone or whatever you want to call it. But this is what oils the uh, fifth gear underneath the fifth gear. So you see that it has to go in this extension housing over here. This is only in a non-world class. The problem is oftentimes people don't realize this is in here and they'll tighten the tail housing and catch it where it's not supposed to be and break this. So you gotta hold it in with grease when you put it together. So far everything looks good, but again, I hear a lot of noise in this unit, so I don't know where it's coming from. With any T5 5-speed, you take out the, this is called the offset lever, you're going to have a spring and a ball, and the pin, the pin kind of comes through this. You punch it through, it'll actually fall out of the bottom. It's not a press fit. It's only press fit to the rail, not to this piece. It'll actually come right through it. But a lot of times people, this thing will get stuck in there, okay, like this, and then people will put a new pin on top of it and forget that this pin is still in there, and then you're going to have a mess. You're going to have to take the whole unit and cut this off, okay? So always make sure that you visually see that these three items are off of the offset lever before you, you know, put it away in your parts bin or whatever. Usually what I will do is take the top cover off next, 10 millimeter bolts on it. They're pretty straightforward. All these bolts, you're going to move the cover this way and up. Let's get this out of the way. So you do the same thing, you crack these bolts loose. These have a tendency to strip out really easy, okay? And I mean easy. So oftentimes you'll pull these out, these bolts, and parts of the aluminum threads will come out. So make sure, like you could see some funky stuff there. That's where they have the thread locker in there. And sometimes the thread locker that they use is so severe that it ruins the threads. And it was probably ruined from the factory. And so you want to take note that if, you know, to inspect the bolts and look at them as you take them out to make sure that no threads are coming out with the bolts. So you're not stuck in a situation where you're putting it together and then you have to heal a coil or something and already it's all together. So this way you can make your, think about making your thread repairs before you put the whole unit together. These came out okay, but who knows? So the T5 has an area in the back over here that's a space between the cover that you can pry up on. And usually on both sides is a space over here that you can get into and pry it. And the cover goes like this and up. So it goes like that and up and it comes out, okay? If we look at it, we could take a quick look at the forks. They look okay, the pads are shot, but the forks are in decent shape. These are early forks. They have a little less webbing on them than the newer forks do. The cams are okay, but one thing that I noticed right away is the interlock is broken, and that might have been what we were hearing inside here. There's an interlock piece that goes inside here, and that piece is missing. So the interlock was broken on this, 
And that's what probably gave this person shifting issues. The gear set looks really good, but the problem is, is we don't know if this, this gear set then uh, is damaged because of pieces from the interlock getting into it. But the gear set looks kind of good, so I'm really happy that this core looks actually in really nice shape. So just a regular rebuild kit and fixing that interlock hopefully will take care of the issue. Even the sliders look good. I'm very excited. Okay, what I like to do next is remove the fifth speed fork, fifth speed synchronizer assembly, and the lower fifth speed gear. That's this big gear below here. And to do that, you take out this dowel pin that's on this fork. It's a 3 16 diameter dowel pin. As a matter of fact, before I think I said the offset lever was 5 30 seconds. In fact, all the dowel pins in the whole transmission are 3 16 And the, the problem with these early cases is they had this big hole and they had no support on the rail over here. The newer cases actually have a a more streamlined hole to support the rail better. So if you start pounding on this rail, knocking out the pin, it's possible that you can bend it. So I just simply put a socket underneath it and kind of rotate it so it's supported. Then get in here and punch the pin through. That's all I do. See, very simple. Now, there's a small little snap ring over here. Let's see if I can get you to see that over there. There it is right there. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to remove this little true arc snap ring for the fifth speed assembly. Be careful not to overstretch it. There's gonna be a spacer here, this little spacer, all right? And sometimes these will slide off. All right now, it looks like somebody's been in this before because this fork should come right off, but maybe somebody was beating on it and mushroomed the end of it. Who knows? But we're going to try to see if we can get this off with a small hammer. There we go. Right. Notice the direction of the fist speed assembly, how the taper is facing towards the rear of the transmission. And what you don't want to do is remove this retaining plate here. They're not available anymore, so if you break it, you're going to have problems. So what we're doing is we're inspecting it. The teeth look like they're in fairly good shape. All the keys are here. So it looks like a nice piece. So we're going to just put that aside. Fork. Nothing is wrong with the fork. The pads are actually in good shape, but I might want to upgrade this to a later fork, which has a little bit longer stem over here. It's about here. And that kind of supports the fork better, keeps it from going like this. The fifth gear will come right off. And if you look here, notice it's a bronze synchronizer ring, just like a world class. Ring's fitting at a good height. Doesn't lock up anymore, but Rings good. Gear looks like it's in fairly good shape. Looks like it might have been changed once before because these numbers, these kind of new numbers, are from later gears. You have to rotate the rail so that this roller clears the case, okay? So I like to take the front bearing tanner off next. You've got four bolts, 13 millimeter heads on each bolt. I've shocked them loose already. You want to pay attention to the threads on the bolts. Again, make sure that no aluminum comes out of the case with the bolt. Take them out very slowly if you can. Inspect them. Make sure again that there's no aluminum on them because I've seen many people put these units together only to find out that they're missing threads in the case and have to heal coil it while everything is inside and drill and tap and you really don't want to do that if you can avoid that with a case already together. These look pretty good. Uh, I'll probably put new hardware on these as well. These uh, retainers have an area to be pried against, okay? And this one actually came off pretty easy. Everything looks good. You could see some metal behind the seal over here. And the seal is rock hard. It's pretty bad. 
The input shafts will pull right out of the front. There's a, a flat area that, that is on the input shaft. You just kind of rotate it until the flat clears the counter gear and you pull the input out. There'll be some needle bearings that belong in the input shaft. I'm not really happy what I'm seeing here because these, input, these needle bearings look chewed up. And that means that the main shaft could be chewed up and that's not a good thing. That's a problem with these units. And yes, it is. The main shaft is wasted on it. So it's got brass synchronizer rings, which are common for the, the non-world class transmissions. You can slide the rear race out from the, from the back. Once the rear race is out, you can lift this whole main shaft assembly with the fifth gear right through the top of the transmission. Now, sometimes you might have to wiggle things around a bit, but it will come right out. See that, what I'm doing? I try to get it where it kind of clears the fifth reverse lever. And the main shaft will come right out. We're going to deal with the issues with the main shaft later. I'll show you, but let's get into taking the counting gear apart. So, we've got a little spring here. That is for the reverse fork. That anchors onto this pin over here and to the casting kind of tab on the fork over here, you see? So put that aside, take out the flat roller bearing that fell off the input shaft. Now, this is the big difference between world-class and non-world-class transmissions. This counter gear floats on flat roller bearings. And you notice it has all this end play in it. That's normal because it's the thrust washer in the front of the counter gear and the thrust washer in the extension housing that keep the gear from actually moving. When I reassemble this, I'll show you how that all fits together without the top end in there so you get a better understanding of how it works. All right, so the first step in removing the counter gear is to remove the snap ring that holds the rear thrust washer and the rear bearing of the counter gear. And we just kind of walk it up. It's a very thin snap ring. There's a new one in the kits. Anytime you remove these, they're gonna stretch out. But these thrust washers, they don't usually go bad, but they're not in most of the Rebel kits. So you want to make sure that you don't lose them. That's what it looks like. They never really go bad, so just don't lose them. There's going to be one on the other side of this bearing as well. So the next thing I'm going to do is remove the reverse idler gear. I want you to take note of a few things. We're going to remove this roll pin over here. There's an O-ring over here. It basically just kind of cushions the gear so it doesn't slap against the aluminum. And take note of how the gear teeth are facing. The, the, the pointy end of the reverse eyelet is facing towards the pointy teeth of the counter gear. Or if you want to look at it another way, the pointy teeth are facing towards the rear of the transmission. It's very simple. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to punch this pin out, remove the eyelet gear and the shaft. They'll all come out of the back. Again, this is a 3 16th roll pin. There's that O-ring I was talking about. There's the reverse idler gear and the reverse idler shaft. All right. This bearing is pressed into the case and a lot of times people don't understand how to get this bearing out. You can kind of try and hit it with a punch a little bit to start it, which is usually what I do. But the factory overhaul manual actually called for taking a brass drift or aluminum drift and hitting the gear right here on this shoulder, right here on this shoulder, right over here. And that'll just pop this bearing out. So what I like to do is I like to test first with a punch to see if this bearing is even going to move easily. So what I'll do is I'll just go here like this, put a punch here, and this thing is in there tight, which is good. So you can see I've kind of moved that bearing a little bit and I have a lot more end play now. And so you really got to be careful that you don't damage There's another spacer over here. You can go in with a, a smaller punch and try to work things out a little bit better now that you have clearance, okay? Let 
All right, so when I feel that I've got that bearing pushed out as much as I can with the small punch, you know, getting in there, knocking it out as much as I can, of course, be careful not to damage the gear itself. What I'm going to do is I'm going to heat this up a little bit, and that'll help get the rest of this bearing out easy. Since aluminum and steel expand at different rates, this will aid in popping this bearing out. This is one big difference between this bearing and what's on world-class transmissions because in world-class transmissions, you have tapered cups and cones and you don't have these flat cylindrical roller bearings in them. We got things a little smoldering there, right? All right, so let me get a better angle on it so you can see what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this aluminum drift in here now while this thing is kind of cooling, kind of supporting the drift on the edge of the case over here. Here we go. Just about out. That's what that bearing looks like. This is actually a standard wheel bearing that's used in a, a Chevy 12 bolt rear, believe it or not. And here's that other thrust washer I was talking about. Thin washer goes towards the front and the thick washer goes towards the back. All right. There's a thrust washer counter gear and look at this huh. that's odd you can see the broken interlock that was one big issue and here's the thrust washer now the thrust washer isn't in bad shape and a lot of times you may want to reuse these because they're not available they have new ones that are steel coated but Considering the age of this washer, it's in pretty good shape. So as you can see, the cylindrical roller bearing that's in the front of the case, all right, check that out there. That needs to come out. Always push it from the inside out, never from the outside in. Some of these bearings have a, a lip on them for that uses uh, silicone to seal against the lip and the case. So I just use a little socket setup that I have here and just Okay, so the case is pretty much completely disassembled, except for the fifth and reverse lever. Usually I don't remove these unless it's broken. There's no reason to take it apart. This has also got a tamper-proof bolt on it, which has a lot of special thread locker on it. So you really have to heat these out, up and get them out. And see the way it has this tamper-proof? Unless you have a, it's a, a 45 a Torx bit, but with this recessed hole in it, you're not gonna take this out. So a lot of times just leave it in there. They usually don't leak from them, but if you got to, you know, if you have to take this apart, you can just slide this clip out like this and take the fork out that way. Okay. So now the main case is completely disassembled. We can take out the plugs if we want later on before we clean this mess up. All right. So here's the main problem here. This is the correct diameter on the outside. And you see this over here, this is all worn away. So the surface hardness of the main shaft got eaten up. It could have had no lubrication going through it. A lot of times people put gear lube in these, which is the wrong lubricant. They're supposed to take Dexron uh, 4 or 5 is what they call for in the day. But you can use any type of Mercon or synchro mesh fluid, something light like that. It doesn't get up inside the needle bearings and then they starve of oil and basically burn up like this. See that? The other problem that can cause this is poor bell housing misalignment. You cock the needle bearings in the input shaft, you know, 
let's say like this, it's not running true anymore. It's running slightly at an angle like that. I'm exaggerating it. But when this happens, the needles cock and they lock up and then skid on the, the main shaft, go through the case hardening. Case hardening on these main shafts is only around 30 thousandths thick, okay? So it's very easy to eat right through it. So we have a good input shaft. The main shaft is beat. We're gonna see about if I have an extra main shaft laying around or I might have to send this out and get it repaired. And, and the way they repair these is they'll sleeve them or they'll hard weld them and then regrind them again. And usually the hard welding process is actually better because it's a much more deeper case to, to the shaft. So they'll cut a little bit of the shaft down, weld it up, regrind it, and then you'll have a perfect piece ready to go. And this gear set's in really nice shape. So what I'm gonna have to do is rebuild this whole transmission, obviously with a rebuild kit, but then you know change first gear, second gear, third gear, synchronizer rings, main drive synchronizer rings, all the bearings, repair the main shaft and put another top cover on it and it's good to go. So let's get to taking this main shaft apart now. So what I usually do is, these aren't usually pressed that tight, so I usually hold behind third speed gear and I just tap the main shaft lightly, like this. If it, see it's moving. So if it doesn't move, then I'll put it on the press, but this is coming right out. So this is a third speed synchronizer ring. Notice it's a bronze or brass ring, whatever you want to call it, instead of a carbon fiber ring. These synchronizer assemblies, there's an X over here and the X usually marks where the key slot is. So they do that on purpose because some of these only have cutouts for keys in just three locations. So X marks the spot, right? So the next thing we want to do is remove the second speed gear. And there's a snap ring that's on here. Yep. And there's new ones, of course, in the small parts kit, so I don't really care if I overstretch the snap ring, but there it is. And there's a tanged thrust washer. You kind of go like this a little bit. Take a screwdriver, break the washer loose, you see? And it'll come off. That looks like. Your second gear. Your second gear synchronizer ring. So from the looks of this transmission, it appears that it was a really good shifting gearbox, but this situation happened here, which would have created a lot of noise. And then for some reason, the offset lever was shifting and then it just busted the interlock for some reason. Now, there's your one, two slider, comes right out. There's gonna be the keys that can come out. There's three keys for this. All right, use these keys. Now, one of the most common questions I get asked all the time is this little ball here. There's a little ball in here that usually comes out in the wash or whatever. It doesn't need to go back in. What they did was they used this to kind of keep it as an anti-rattle piece. It's in there pretty good, so I'm gonna leave it alone. That keeps the slider from rattling around. It serves no other function other than to keep some tension on the slider so it's not kind of jiggling around on the main shaft and making noise. Let's go flip it around this way now. They have a yoke stop snap ring on this. That's all this is. Uh, you can leave them off. It's not important to have on there. In fact, I don't like using these because if the yoke hits the snap ring, it can blow it off and go inside the transmission. So I never got the reason why they have these. And you've got the speedometer gear on here now too. And you can just press the clip down and kind of tap the gear off. The F body uh, main shafts, only came with a blue gear, which was seven tooth, and a red gear, which was nine tooth. So if you're building these boxes and you have to maybe change the rear axle ratio, just remember what kind of gear you have. So this is a seven tooth gear, and the red ones are nine tooth. There's no eight tooth ones. It's the clip and the gear. A lot of times people ask me, by the way, how do you count the teeth on these gears? 
You simply lay them on their side, and when each worm comes to an end, you'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You see, that's how they work. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's how you count the teeth on a speedometer gear. Now let's look at this fifth speed gear here. Now I want you to take note of something of the length of this gear. There are several different length fifth speed gears. Some of them are about three eighths of an inch shorter. Oftentimes people will call me up, buy another gear and not pay attention to the length, press the gear on and wonder why there's a big gap between the end of the gear and the snap ring. The early gears were much longer. Some of the main shafts actually had two snap ring grooves in them for the different length fist speed gears. Some of these gears will come off really easy, which I don't like. And then some of them will come off uh, and you need to press on them. So we'll see what happens. If this thing slides off, great. If it doesn't, these are very shallow, these snap rings. Now, usually what I'll do is I'll tap the end of the main shaft just to see if this moves and it doesn't. So this is going to have to go on the press. Okay, before we get this on the press, there's something I want to address here. In between the rear bearing and the first speed gear, there's going to be a thrust washer. Later units have a floating washer, and it kind of looks like that that's what's there. It's hard to say, but it does look like the washer is a floating washer. It means the washer is just spinning around in between the gear. It's not fastened to anything. Early transmissions actually had a roll pin that went inside the main shaft, and the thrust washer went into the roll pin, and it didn't freely spin. There's no way of getting that, this thing apart unless the roll pin gets sheared off when you press the first gear off, and that's acceptable. But you're always going to be replacing the washer over here with the floating washer. Again, this one I can see it looks like it's a floating washer, so we don't have that roll pin issue. But again, certain transmissions will have roll pins underneath there that will have to get sheared. Others will have a first gear that actually has a roller bearing and a race over here. Some of the Jeep non-world class transmissions had a first gear roller bearing. Same thing with the S10 Blazers. So this is going to go on the press and we're going to take off first gear. So I'm supporting the main shaft underneath first speed gear. Got everything ready to go. I'm going to press it right through. This one's a tight one. Here we go. It's all off. That's your fifth gear. You got the rear bearing and you got the floating washer. See what I mean by this washer? There's nothing that holds it in place. It just floats around like this. Get the first speed gear. First speed synchronizer ring. And the other spring is in here for the synchronizer. And that's your main shaft. All right, so I got everything laid out on the bench so you can kind of see what is wrong with the unit and what the solutions are going to be. And uh, let's go take apart that top cover now and get that apart. And then pretty much I think that's it. So we're gonna take this top cover apart now. You can see the interlock's broken. Usually this happens because people try to power shift these transmissions. So you go from first to second and you slam over to third. These transmissions really don't like that. You really have to go from first to second, then over and up into third. Doing that will usually catch the interlock in a position and, and break it. It's powdered metal, so the interlock snapped. But anyway, the three four fork, if you look at the shift lug, is below the one two fork, okay? And when you want to try to punch these out, you want to have it out of diagonal like this because if you have it straight down, you're going to lock the pin up into the cover. It's a 3 16 dowel, so we're going to just do this now and get it out. Okay, the shift finger, we're going to replace it with a solid shift finger. I don't have any in stock right now, but I think they're going to be coming in soon. Here's a three, four fork. 
with the 3-4 lug. These lugs too, they have a tendency to stretch out on these early boxes. And especially if this thing has been uh, working against a broken interlock, there's a good possibility that these lugs are going to be stretched out. Here's the 1-2 fork with the 1-2 shift lug. Top cover. You have an O-ring on the top cover that you will have to replace. All right, but we can see here that somebody thought it was funny for some reason to drill a hole in here. So that cover is no good. So now that I got the unit apart, I've got everything laid out on the bench. Let's just go over everything. So here we get the case. Case is in nice shape. We didn't see any strip threads, anything cracked, anything like that. It looks really good. So what we've got here is third gear. Third gear looks really good. The engagement teeth are a little beat up on it, but it looks like it'll be fine. Second gear, same thing. Gear looks good, but the engagement teeth are kind of hammered on it. So I don't know again if I'm gonna even be able to get these gears, but I think they're still usable. First gear is in excellent condition. Everything needs synchronizer rings. That's no problem. Main drive gear, input shaft looks really good. Cluster gear is in excellent shape. A lot of times, and you can put this down here, if you look right over here, these races tend to get worn out on these non-world-class units. So you always want to check that this area isn't pitted at all. It looks pretty good. And also that the front face of the gear that rides against the thrust washer is also in good shape. It looks very good. The one-two slider is also in good shape. Teeth still have some point definition. But a lot of times, if you run your finger over here like this, along these edges like this, sometimes you'll feel a little bit of a sharp edge, which means the teeth are raised a little bit. These sliders are not expensive, so it's always worth it to just change them. The fifth gear synchronizer assembly is in good shape. Looks pretty good. Hub is good as well. No issues with it. And as I mentioned, do not take out this retainer plate. If you have to, be very careful prying it out so that you don't break it. The three, four synchronizer assembly is in really good shape, but the keys were broken. Don't know why, but they were broken. That's it. The bearings are in really good shape. You got the input shaft bearing over here and race. You could see that these races aren't pitted at all. They're actually in pretty good shape. And the flat roller bearings are unpitted as well. They're also in good shape. But I wanted to point out, you see, this bearing has this little lip on it over here. That's why you have to punch them from the inside out, because this little lip here is what kind of captures the silicone sealer against the case and keeps it from leaking. This is an update, and unfortunately, this bearing is no longer available. So we'll be replacing it with a standard type bearing without the slip, but we're gonna put anaerobic sealant around the whole circumference of the bearing and in the bore of the case, and it should be fine. I've done that before like that, there's no issues. Reverse idler's in good shape. No problems with the reverse idler. Still got good point definition, no big chips out of it. Fist speed gear is in excellent condition. Looks really good. All these synchronizer rings, aren't really working that well. They don't seem to grab the gears that well. So they're, they're gonna have to be changed anyway because that's what comes in a rebuild. Fispy gear over here, excellent condition, no chips, nothing's wrong with it. Front bearing retainer, looks really good. No big gouges in it, pretty straight on. Shift forks all look good, lugs look pretty good. And of course, the main shaft we know is bad. This whole area is worn, look at this, see that? cover. I don't know why somebody put a hole in it, but they did. So that's scrap. Shift rails are all in good shape. No problems with any of these rails. They're in nice shape. And I get all the miscellaneous hardware and garbage in them, this little box here. So you're going to have to wait a little bit for part two to come out because I got to get that main shaft repaired. It's going to take about three weeks to get that done. In the meantime, I want to thank everybody for watching this video, subscribing to my channel, buying me coffee, all of that good stuff. And always you can say, Alexa, hey, 
buy Paul Cangelosi's book. It's on Amazon. Please get it before it runs out. I don't know again if it's going to be reprinted this time. Okay, guys? Thanks very much for watching. See you soon.